It is a delight to be able to be here with you this morning to tell you a little bit about the Trans NIH uh, Interest Group. I think you're going to find it uh, uh, interesting uh, for those of you who have not uh, uh, been aware of it to date. Um, before I start, I'd just like to say thank you to the SENS Research Foundation and to Aubrey for the opportunity to uh, be with you today and uh, tell you about uh, this activity. Um, and uh, here we go. Uh, first of all, um, the background on this initiative is that it is essentially a strategic effort to try to increase alignment across the 27 institutes and centers at the NIH, uh, alignment around uh, the need to get behind a common understanding that the biology of aging really relates to everything that's happening to each and every, uh, at each and every one of those uh, centers, in particular as it relates to uh, the diseases uh, of aging. So it's a strategic effort that was launched about two and a half years ago by Dr. Felipe Sierra. Felipe uh, is the director of the Division of Aging Biology at the National Institute on Aging, NIA. Um, and he is uh, the brainchild behind this, while uh, other organizations have sort of helped to shepherd it along. Um, he is really the one who has, uh, through his tireless efforts, uh, made this trans-NIH um, geroscience interest group a reality. Um, so I wanted to recognize him right up front for his fine efforts, as well as to say thank you to him for uh, creating the slides that I'm going to be sharing with you today to illustrate the fine work that he's done. Now, what, uh, what I'm going to do before I actually tell you a bit more about that, uh, the interest group and what it does and how you may get involved if you're, if you're interested, I really want to tell you the rationale behind it that Felipe has used when going out to those 27 other institutes and centers at the NIH. And I uh, assume all of you are aware, but I'll just refresh your memory. The NIH is uh, that government entity that's charged with advancing research uh, to help improve the nation's health in the United States. Um, so uh, this effort that, that, that Felipe has, has gotten underway is truly going to be transformative. And uh, by sharing with you the rationale that he has come up with to sort of make the case to other institutes, uh, I hope that perhaps there's some thoughts in there that you all can use when you're communicating with uh, government officials, um, with private corporations, as well as with private philanthropists around the value of investing in aging research and how it can not only improve uh, aging, but in, in fact, along the way, solve a lot of the problems that we now have as a result of uh, chronic diseases of, uh, of the aging process. Um, the bottom line assumption in all of this is that we agree that the goal of biomedical research is to increase uh, the quality of human life. Uh, and that chronic diseases of the elderly are currently the main limitation to achieving that goal. That's the starting place for, uh, for this whole project. Now, the world is, uh, is aging rapidly. This is not news to any of you. Uh, but these two slides uh, bring it into uh, stark uh, uh, contrast, I think. In particular, again, for those who are in other institutes and centers beyond the National Institute on Aging, who aren't really thinking about uh, aging demographics because they're focused on their particular areas of research. The left-hand graph uh, illustrates uh, the percentage of the uh, U.S. population that is under five, um, I'm sorry, world population under five, as well as the percentage of the world population over 65. As you'll see, the blue curve is uh, coming down dramatically as a, as a percentage, uh, and the uh, green curve is going up dramatically. So we're having a situation in which the demographics uh, uh, of the world are moving uh, dramatically older. Now, uh, the right-hand slide illustrates in a different way different age cohorts um, 0 to 64, 65 plus, 85 plus, and 100 plus, to illustrate the percentage of the population that is going to be in each of those cohorts. And again, it's dramatic growth over the next uh, uh, 17 years or so in those cohorts. Now, many times you'll see these types of slides, and it's because people want to say this is a bad news situation, right? What are we going to do? Especially in Washington, D.C., what are we going to do with the aging population? Uh, it's going to cause us to become bankrupt. Well, this is really, I think, and we ought to be thinking of it as scientists, as a good news slide. The reason that these graphs are going this direction, the reason that we have people living longer, and the reason we have 
um, uh, fewer uh, individuals sort of under the age of five is because science has been successful in solving a lot of the issues uh, uh, facing humanity over the past 200 years. It was good science that figured out sanitation uh, to eliminate uh, a lot of infectious diseases. It was good science that figured out how to feed uh, the world uh, through agricultural science. We have adequate food to feed our populations, as well as science that came up with the anti-infectives and the vaccines to help eliminate many of the diseases that would uh, kill uh, individuals before they hit age one. So that's a good news situation. We are uh, living longer because science has done uh, great uh, work to, to advance lifespan. The downside, of course, is that um, we have the issues that come along with an increased lifespan. That is the uh, chronic diseases of aging. So we're sort of, we've solved one problem and now we've created net yet a new one for all of us collectively to figure out how to solve. The, uh, uh, just sort of picking up on a, a phrase that the Alzheimer's community has used in the United States, uh, we can't wait. Um, the bottom line is we really can't wait um, to address the major risk factor for most chronic diseases, and that is aging. And, and by aging, we don't mean just how old you are, but all the physiological processes that happen uh, as we age. So we can't wait. Now, the 10 leading causes of death in the United States are, are shown here. Um, in the developed uh, world broadly, this, uh, this graph uh, probably lines up pretty, uh, pretty close to other, uh, other countries. Uh, the leading cause, of course, is uh, cardiovascular disease, as it, as it has been uh, for some time. Uh, if we look at some of the risk factors associated uh, with uh, cardiovascular disease, and these risk factors come right from one of those institutes at the National Institute of Health, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, right from their website, uh, these are the risk factors for cardiovascular disease that they, list, they show. Does, does, is anything missing from that list as you look at it? <coughs> This is a bit, a bit sort of odd, right? Um, now, of course, there are disease-specific factors, and as well, there are uh, factors that are much more focused on behavioral issues as well as environmental exposures. Uh, but the one big thing, and you all have picked up on it, that's not there is aging. It is not listed as a risk factor. Now, it's really puzzling. It's, it's puzzling especially because we know from, uh, from published research uh, that aging is a factor. Um, we, we know for, certainly from a disease-specific uh, uh, aspect, cholesterol, increasing cholesterol levels uh, leads to an, a threefold increase in relative risk of cardiovascular disease. We know that. That's proven. We also know um, that uh, aging increases the relative risk for cardiovascular disease. It's a seven-fold increase for males and a 16-fold increase for females, so dramatically increased relative risk, more so than, than cholesterol. Um, and yet it's not even listed on the NHLBI website. Now, it's even more puzzle puzzling because, as you can see, the reference for this last bit of research is the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So they acknowledge it, and yet it's not listed as a risk factor. So what just sort of emblematic of some of the challenges, I think, that we encounter as we go forward in helping uh, every uh, institute at NIH to understand that they have a stake in some shape, form, or fashion in the biology of aging. Um, so this, this residual uh, is quite large, that is, aging is quite large, and at a minimum it ought to be added to uh, the list of risk factors, physiological aging, and I think some would make the case that uh, it should be perhaps at the top of the list, uh, the, the, given the dramatic increase in relative risk that occurs with cardiovascular disease as we age. Now, to illustrate sort of this, uh, the implications of physiological aging as, as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and others, we can sort of look at a, at a model that illustrates the interplay between uh, various um, uh, disease-specific variables as well as environmental behavioral variables uh, and age-specific variables as, as shown here. Uh, so the notion that there are specific um, elements that go disease by disease, as well as various factors in the environment or uh, as a result of individual behavior that lead to disease, and then the uh, aspects that relate to aging in, in particular. So said another way, it's genetic susceptibility, um, it's uh, genetic uh, predisposition, or it's the genetics, genetics of aging. And when you get them all together, there's that spot in the middle where um, again, this is uh, just a model to, to conceptually lay it out for other, other institutes, but there's that place in the middle where the disease is really uh, happening. 
Uh, and that ultimately, when those three uh, areas overlap, that's when uh, the disease really takes off. Um, and then to illustrate sort of with the, the science behind each of these things, we already talked about the cholesterol, uh, increasing cholesterol levels leading to a dramatically increased relative risk. Um, we also uh, know from uh, research that behavioral uh, issues around uh, obesity lead to a dramatically increased uh, cardiovascular risk. And then we know that aging, in particular, has this dramatic uh, increase. And if anyone's wondering why it's so much uh, you know, 16-fold for females versus 7-fold for males, it's just the females start at such a, a lower um, place in terms, of, uh, in terms of risk. So they're, as they get older, uh, from a relative perspective, it's a 16-fold it's a increase. Now, cynics will say, well, you know, you can't do anything about aging. We are aging. Uh, it all is a function, essentially, of uh, what it shows on your birth certificate. Well, um, understand that, and yet we know from longstanding research that uh, lifespan is plastic uh, and that there are uh, multiple places along the way uh, where interventions can be made to affect lifespan. Um, and we also know that there are non-genetic um, mechanisms for extending lifespan, for example, with calorie restriction. Oops. And uh, resveratrol and rapamycin as well uh, in mouse models are shown to, again, increase lifespan. Uh, and again, I, I, I su suspect that uh, most of you are quite familiar with, uh, uh, with this research. And on looking on the, again, the bright spot ahead, there's uh, a potential opportunity out there that other interventions currently being tested uh, can indeed, indeed have an impact. And uh, the uh, illustration here of the iceberg is just to say that uh, these are four that are visible, and we hope that beneath the surface, just with a, an iceberg, there are many more interventions, many of which you all are working on, uh, that can help us uh, address this issue. So in summary, lifespan, um, uh, of many species can be uh, extended through dietary restriction. We've known that for some time. Um, genetics has uh, identified multiple molecular pathways that are involved and where you can have interventions. Uh, and in fact, we know through some non-genetic uh, interventions, uh, resveratrol and rapamycin in particular, uh, that we can impact lifespan. The unanswered question, and really what we want to get to, is uh, whether or not these manipulations increase health and extend health span, because it's not, uh, it's one thing to increase lifespan, uh, but the real sweet spot uh, in particular when talking with government officials is, are you increasing health span? So we can shorten that period of time uh, as we age, older adults experience uh, morbidity, um, so we can shrink that window, therefore increase their quality of life uh, and decrease health care costs towards the end of life. And the short answer is yes. Uh, the research indicate that health span is also increased. Um, uh, that's been documented through calorie restriction as well as with uh, resveratrol, um, delaying the appearance of uh, age and disease-related inflammation, et cetera. So health span is also increased. Um, so the most effective, and we, we say now, again, this is making the case to other institutes for why they should be inter interested. The most effective and now apparently possible way of addressing chronic diseases uh, of the elderly is to address the major risk factor driving all of them, and that is aging. Now, one of the challenges uh, that we experience in the aging community when talking to the public is that the public doesn't really, number one, they don't want to think about getting older, but they also think of themselves as getting individual diseases. I get diabetes, or I may develop arthritis. They don't think of themselves as getting aging. Um, and really, at NIH, we've taken the same approach uh, in the United States. It's all broken down by individual diseases. That's sort of why we're in the box that we're in right now, because uh, that's how it was broken out. So there's Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, National Cancer Institute, et cetera. So in order to make the case to, uh, to others outside the aging field about the benefit of uh, addressing the basic biology of aging, it's good to illustrate it by suggesting, well, what if we actually eliminated one of those uh, major diseases that are killing so many uh, Americans? So this uh, uh, next couple slides are going to be used to illustrate that. What you see here uh, is a slide with uh, six sort of major areas that, that take out uh, quite a number of, uh, of humans uh, with uh, 
uh, musculoskeletal and cardiovascular, uh, cognitive issues, uh, uh, glucose homeostasis, uh, immune uh, issues. So this, these lines, the, the blue bar representing one individual and the yellow representing another, sort of shows their life course. And across, uh, over time, as uh, physiology of aging, aging on furrows and, and depending on their uh, diet and behavior, um, et cetera, uh, their predispositions, something is going to get them. And when that bar ends, that's when, uh, that's when they, they die. Um, so if you look at the first individual here, um, the, what takes out uh, the individual on the blue line uh, is cardiovascular disease, very consistent with uh, what we just showed uh, uh, earlier in terms of cardiovascular disease being the major the number one killer. Um, the second individual, though, does not die of cardiovascular disease. Uh, his genetics uh, sort of support uh, him in that area, but uh, he gets taken out by some sort of immune-related disorder. Right? So it's essentially whichever fails first, that's what's going to get you. Now, um, what if we eliminate cardiovascular disease altogether? Thanks to the wonderful research that's being done, uh, somehow we can eliminate all cardiovascular disease. Well, what happens, right? You think, well, everyone's going to live so much longer. Well, let's just look at these two individuals. Well, what happens with them is that <clears throat> um, all cardiovascular disease now goes away. Well, do they live a lot longer? No, they live a little longer. At least uh, um, uh, D2 gets to, uh, um, uh, or D1 gets to live a little bit longer, does not experience cardiovascular disease. But individual number two still dies of whatever the immune condition was uh, that's going to kill him. So by eliminating cardiovascular disease, it really does not dramatically affect the life course of that, that other individual. If, you were, if the only thing that was going to kill you is cardiovascular disease, great. But given all the other chronic diseases of aging, it's likely something else will, uh, will, will get you. Now, um, so this is, what, this is where D1 uh, gets to go to, uh, shown another way. By eliminating cardiovascular disease, this is the increase in lifespan that happens for, uh, uh, for individual uh, D1. Now, the, uh, if you back to sort of where it began then, so what does that mean then? If we eliminate an entire disease, cardiovascular disease goes away altogether, and that's all the extension we get, well, what does this really get, get at? Well, it gets to the fact that we need to begin to understand the basic biological issues that affect all the chronic diseases of aging so that we can have appropriate interventions that will affect each and every one of these chronic diseases, with the ultimate goal being to move everyone to the right because we've been able to, uh, to shift that, uh, that sort of morbidity, morbidity mortality uh, curve way, uh, way to the right. So that's the ultimate goal. And again, trying to get this across to the other institutes and centers, uh, this is part of making that case for why they have a stake in the, the aging biology. Um, in, in, uh, to be successful, a, uh, aging biology really um, um, putting more investments there should uh, result in a uh, better success rate in translating these findings into improvements of, uh, uh, for human health. Um, it should also lead to a better understanding of each of the individual diseases. Um, by understanding the basics uh, uh, biology of aging, it can lead to insights into each of those other individual diseases. And then perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, it can help us understand all the comorbidities that are happening as we age, as, as individuals age. Now, the, uh, the slide here sort of just collects together a lot of the many different areas that uh, uh, many of you are working in uh, and, and other fields as well, uh, where research is happening uh, that looks, uh, that is impacting the biology uh, of aging. Um, and Felipe um, has sort of put them all together and sort of come up with, as relates to aging, these major themes, these are sort of the six big themes of, uh, around which uh, he's built this, uh, this idea, this trans-NIH geroscience uh, interest group. And then um, the notion is that all the chronic diseases of aging, and you see them illustrated here, uh, that they are all touched in some way or touched by uh, issues around inflammation and stress response and uh, frailty and resilience, that they all somehow touch each and every one of these, uh, these uh, diseases. And each disease here is essentially represented by a different institute at the National Institute of Health. All right? So you see the, the challenge we have here, that 
All these institutes are off sort of doing their own wonderful research, uh, but there's an opportunity here to better coordinate and collaborate um, around research that's more innovative that will help every one of the institutes in solving their individual challenges if that innovation is around how do we collectively better understand um, uh, biology of aging and how we can have interventions to, to address human health. So the question that comes up is how do you get all these different institutes and centers that are well established and uh, uh, are well focused on what they're doing, how do you get them to collaborate? Well, uh, uh, Felipe Serra came up with this idea, let's create an uh, initiative across the entire NIH that gets at GERO science um, and see if we can get the other institutes to buy into becoming involved in this. And that is, in fact, um, what he did. Um, two and a half years ago, started this group, began to outreach to other institutes and talk to the staff members there about this idea. <coughs> he laid out uh, a case similar to what I've shared with you this morning uh, for why it makes sense. Um, and to date, he has been able to get 20 of the 27 uh, institutes at, at NIH to sign on to this trans-NIH initiative. Now, there are, about, there are several different trans-NIH uh, working groups like this. This is already, even though it's very young, uh, is already one of the largest. Uh, the seven institutes that have not signed on uh, are, the, are smaller institutes and really have a very modest, if any, stake uh, in, in aging. So really, all the institutes that should be there are represented. Um, one of the things that Felipe is very proud of is the fact that this initiative has been extremely organic. It was uh, conversations with individual staff members, members at the center uh, that got them interested, at each center that got them interested, um, and they you know, took it to their uh, director, um, and at the director level, and the director of each institute had to sign off on this. They said, yes, we want to get involved, we want to support the work of this trans-NIH uh, geroscience interest group. So we've got uh, support at the grassroots, as well as the sign-off and support of um, the directors of each of the centers. So it's a very positive development. Um, it's, uh, there are ways that you can get involved if you're interested. Uh, at a minimum, you can go and sign up to be on the listserv for the interest group. Uh, they also have a newsletter that comes out. You can be aware of what they're up to. Um, it is not, I want to be clear, this is not an endeavor that is being run by the National Institute on Aging. That's not the case. While, the brain, while Felipe may have been the brainchild for it, it is coordinated by uh, a group of uh, individuals from multiple institutes. So there's buy-in, again, across, across NIH for this. Um, they have uh, regular workshops that bring together researchers from the various institutes to uh, sort of identify ways that uh, people can, can work together. Um, and those uh, workshops are published on, uh, on, the, on the website. You can actually watch the, uh, watch the video uh, of that. Uh, Felipe has recently uh, taken to uh, use the, the wonderful technology of YouTube to talk about uh, uh, the Jero Science uh, Interest Group. Um, so I'd encourage you, as you're surfing around this evening, uh, have a look at the YouTube uh, video of Felipe talking about this, uh, this institute and the value that he sees, uh, or of the, the interest group, and the value that he sees uh, in it as well. Um, the, uh, uh, as an example, I wanted to uh, share with you um, uh, uh, one of the examples of one, one of the uh, working groups that, um, or one of the workshops that was put together, um, and it shows you how, uh, uh, how they're focusing. In this case, it's how inflammation relates to all age-related diseases. Um, and then a, uh, another one that was put together by Jim Kirkland, uh, looking at the multiple chronic diseases of aging and how, uh, uh, how targeting aging can delay uh, all of those uh, chronic diseases. So uh, because this is an international group, um, I uh, would uh, be remiss if I didn't make sure to alert you to uh, an international gathering happening uh, in October as part of the Geroscience um, uh, Interest Group. Uh, they have put together a two-day program jam-packed uh, with great science uh, that they're sort of calling their Geroscience Summit Meeting. 
uh, bringing together um, uh, quite a number of uh, current researchers in the field, again, not just uh, from NIA, but from all institutes, to talk about um, where there are intersections, where there are opportunities to innovate together. Um, this uh, event is uh, open uh, to anyone. There's no uh, cost to register. We just encourage you to, uh, to, to, to go online and to register. The deadline's been pushed back uh, about two weeks, so there's plenty of time uh, to uh, register to join us. We just need to know who's coming so that we can uh, plan accordingly in terms of uh, meals and, uh, and, and other things. Uh, so please think about that. The agenda uh, is put together around some of those key themes that I uh, uh, illustrated before that Felipe has come up with. Uh, so looking at issues around inflammation and uh, stress, metabolism, et cetera. And you can see listed here uh, the session co-chairs uh, that uh, have been um, uh, invited to sort of uh, set the stage for the discussion. Um, it will be extremely interactive. The goal is really to, uh, um, not to uh, have uh, the speakers talking to the audience, but to have a dialogue with all the researchers there uh, to see how we can advance the whole JARO uh, uh, Science uh, Interest Group initiative and how we can get more uh, collaboration to, uh, to address um, those fundamental issues that underline all the diseases uh, that come along with, uh, with aging. Uh, finally, uh, looking further afield um, for your planning calendars, uh, again, with such an international group, um, the next gathering of the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics is going to be in San Francisco in 2017. Um, GSA is the organization that is putting it together, um, and I just mention it to you because uh, you may want to think about, uh, about participating, and uh, uh, perhaps after this I can chat with Mike about how uh, the SENS uh, Research Foundation can be more involved since we're going to be there uh, in your backyard for this World Congress. Um, so, in summary, the, uh, the Trans-NIH Geroscience Interest Group is uh, a strategic initiative. Um, it's uh, was developed grassroots, but has the support of people at, at senior levels at all the institutes and centers. Um, and it's a starting point. This is not going to solve all the issues overnight, but it can give us hope that uh, through more collaboration, we can help all the uh, other fields outside, all the other institutes outside of NIA to understand they do have a stake in the area of aging research um, and that they should be participating with and helping to support uh, research efforts inside their own institutes uh, that get after uh, the biology of aging as it affects their diseases. As Felipe told me when he and I were chatting, he said, if you were going to come up with some sort of elegant way to measure whether or not we're being successful, um, you know, just as inside the National Institute on Aging, there is one division that focuses just on aging biology. So it's just one division of four at NIA. Uh, Felipe said, you know, what if each of the 20 institutes and centers that are involved in this geroscience interest group, what if each of them had a division of aging biology? That would really be success. Now, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, uh, but it's an interesting, uh, elegant notion to think about that that really is the end game if we can get all those institutes and centers to be thinking about um, the importance of the biology of aging as it relates to their particular uh, center. Thank you very much for your time. I've enjoyed chance to visit with you and be happy to take any questions you may have.